Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Simonian with the Neocon team, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for this April Neocon programming series on Designing Well and today's session with Megan, Amber, and Caroline. A uh, couple of quick items before we get started. Um, today's session qualifies for accreditation and certificates will be mailed within three business days to all attendees who stay on for the full session. Uh, if you have questions about accreditation, uh, please um, visit the programming page on the Neocon website. Also, the final 15 minutes of the session will be Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box. Uh, so let's get started with a little background on our presenters. Caroline Morris is an associate at Clive Wilkinson Architects in Los Angeles. Her background in interior architecture has provided a platform for exploring the intersections of architecture, interior design, graphic design, and product design. Caroline's work is rooted in unearthing her clients' business and social goals to allow human-centered space making to be a catalyst for change. And she has worked on several award-winning projects, including GLG Global Headquarters, Publicis North America Headquarters, the Barbarian Group, Lulu Lemon Store Support Center, and Intuit's Marine Way Building in Mountain View. Also with Clive Wilkinson, Amber Warnick is an award-winning interior designer and strategist with over 12 years experience in workplace, education, healthcare, and residential interiors. Focusing on workplace strategy, she collaborates with some of the world's most creative companies to transform their employee experience. Leading the firm's visioning and research process, she develops design solutions to meet her clients' social, cultural, and functional goals, and has contributed to a diverse range of projects, including the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago, Stanford's campus in Redwood City, and the upcoming Lululemon Global Headquarters in Vancouver. As, as Chief Sustainability Officer at Integral Group in Oakland, California, Megan White is responsible for applying the same levels of ambition and, and performance from Integral's project work to the firm's local and global initiatives, such as net zero carbon buildings commitment um, announced at the 2018 Global Climate Action Summit. Under Megan's direction, every Integral office has already achieved zero scope one and scope two operational carbon emissions with accelerated targets for zero scope three emissions by 2030. In addition to leading the delivery of Integral's annual corporate social and environmental responsibility report, Megan works with leading global organizations to develop and implement transformative sustainability and wellness strategies. With a philosophical approach to bridge the intersection of people and planet, Megan views climate change as a health and social equity issue. She's dedicated to deep green solutions such as zero net energy, water waste, and carbon, as well as reducing the negative impacts of the indoor environment on people via conscious design practices. I'm going to now pass the screen over to Caroline. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks to the entire Neocon team for organizing this. This series on wellness is incredibly relevant as we navigate the repercussions of the pandemic. We're grateful to be here with you all virtually, albeit for now until October when we can get together in person, Chicago. As Lisa had mentioned, we've put some time aside at the end for Q&A, but please do feel free to add your questions or comments as we're going through this. And with that, we'll jump right in. After a year of uncertainty in the pandemic, two things are clear. The office will live on, but we won't be returning to the way things were. The novelty of work from home, virtual happy hours, wearing waist down lounge clothes has long worn off. All joking aside, the year, this year has been extremely challenging with multiple waves of unprecedented crises. And as we begin to return to our workplaces, we need to address how they can better support not only the new ways of working that have been adopted, but also the wide range of human needs of the people who work, grow, and connect in them. So what have we learned from the past year? 
The COVID-19 remote working experiment has put into focus what can and can't be done without a physical workplace. We've seen the many types of work, particularly creation and ideation heavy work, are challenged when not in person. The powerful social and collaborative benefits that the workplace offers have also made themselves painfully clear as many of us have been forced to get by without them. And we've all seen firsthand how critical human contact is for our well-being. Work aside, we also must acknowledge the burden and the trauma of the past year. People are grieving. There's been a loss of lives, jobs, homes, normalcy, stability, expectations, and the list goes on. All that to say that wellness is more important now than ever. Today, we'll talk about the seven dimensions of holistic wellness, why each is important, and how design can impact them. As we reemerge into the world and think about the future of workplace design, now is an opportunity, a pivotal moment actually, to heal, to innovate, and to rebuild with intention. Thanks, Caroline. So, Aetna International recently published this statistic. Since the onset of the pandemic, 74% of all workers, including 88% of those ages 18 to 28, say poor mental health has impacted their productivity. I'm sure this comes as no surprise to this audience. And we're seeing a rise in mental health concerns due to the pandemic, and more particularly, particularly social isolation. You may be reflecting on this personally. I know I am. It has become a shared lived experience, and therefore one where we can start to actually bust through the taboo barrier and start talking about mental health and really start to address the issue head on. Whether it's Zoom fatigue and no breaks between meetings, our work days bleeding into our evenings, not having a diversity of places to go, we start to acknowledge that we are humans, not robots, and we have an innate need beyond the computer screen. We need social interaction to perform at top levels. So I'm gonna paraphrase from Dr. Nicole Opera, who's a self-proclaimed holistic psychologist from Cornell University. She says, stress is more than just a mental state. It is an internal condition that challenges homeostasis. So where norm normative stress helps us to grow and adapt, chronic stress wears us down and harms every part of our body systems. It activates the body's immune system to be become hypervigilant, and it can lead to development of autoimmune diseases, chronic pain, heart disease, and cancer, for example. And so there's a new science called psychoneuroimmunology, which studies the body's inflammation response to stress. It's very connected to this gut-brain relationship that's connected through what's called the vagal nerve. It's also known as polyvagal theory. And it shows that stress alters our reality. So when we're operating in a parasympathetic nervous system or that state within our body, it's actually good. We feel more rested and we feel safe and we properly digest our food. We can feel joy and connected with other individuals. Our ability to problem solve is better and we engage in proper emotional regulation. This state is connected to social engagement and a positive, uh, positive mental outcomes. But on the other side is this chronic stress and it's connected to sympathetic nervous system. And this in turn activates our adrenal glands, increases our cortisone levels, and we start to become defensive. Our body is primed for battle. And we begin to see common patterns of lack of, and we start to lack emotional resilience, an inability to form meaningful connections, and issues of concentration, and of course, difficulty performing higher functioning cognitive tasks. So today we're gonna to talk about these scales of impact. And we first need to acknowledge that we are interpersonal creatures that require connections to survive. We may look towards nature in this way and acknowledge the relationships and the connectivity between all things seen and unseen. From a design process, this means starting at the center with a focus on the human experience. Although too many times we have witnessed a focus on the architecture, this is an important opportunity for the design industry to reset and understand that the purpose of architecture is to respond to the needs of the people. So next, we acknowledge the relationships that exist between those occupants with every other sphere. 
the building itself, the community at the neighborhood scale, the people in the company beyond this building, and the opportunity to influence the world at large. Relationships exist between each sphere, and they all create ripple effects and impact, both consciously and unconsciously, as well as positively and negatively. So when it comes to addressing health and wellness related to desired outcomes on a project, it's important to set the context that we as designers can't solve all health problems for a company. So many aspects of holistic health go beyond the building and are actually a part of the DNA of an organization. So for example, if a company has a culture of overworking their staff, there is nothing we can do in design to fix the next <laughs> um, in fact, affect the negative impacts of burnout. But there are, are opportunities to influence it, and Amber will start to introduce those now. As designers, we know that design impacts behavior. For many of us, this is what makes our work so rewarding. It's not just about designing beautiful spaces. We can actually use the design of the workplace to influence people's choices and improve people's lives. Now more than ever, the design of the office should be strategically designed with wellness at the forefront. For our clients, it's important to understand that enhancing employee wellness will ultimately lead to organizational success. Having happy and healthy employees has proven to result in higher productivity and engagement and lower healthcare clock costs and turnover. The researcher Thomas Wright explains, simply put, psychologically well employees are better performers. Since higher employee performance is tied to an organization's bottom line, employee well-being can play a key role in establishing a competitive advantage. The shift in the work environment and the COVID-19 health crisis have highlighted just how critical it is to develop, but also to maintain a healthy workforce. A wide spectrum of work models has emerged, ranging from work anywhere on one side to 100% in office on the extreme other. But these extremes may be too radical for many organizations with work anywhere employees feeling disconnected from one another and 100% in office employees feeling a lack of trust. The hybrid model arises as the reasonable middle ground, and there's a growing body of research to support it also. This model offers flexibility for workers to work part-time remote and part-time in office. According to a large study done earlier this year, 55% of employees would prefer to be remote at least three days a week once the pandemic concerns fade. So with the future of work looking more and more hybrid every day, it's important that employee wellness go beyond the walls of the office to support employees wherever they're working. Wholeness means we bring all of the elements of who we are to work. Our passions and strengths, our side projects and relationships, our partners and kids. Bringing our whole selves to work means acknowledging our own vulnerabilities as well, which builds trust and engagement amongst coworkers. When people feel safe and understood at work, they're more likely to share creative and innovative ideas with their teams. So more than half of all employees cover up some part of their identity to fit in at work. Underrepresented groups feeling the most pressure of all to cover aspects of themselves. And this is of course because many of our society's institutions are, are historically oppressive and exclusive. In Mike Robbins' book, he explains we can work better, lead better, and be more engaged and fulfilled if instead of trying to hide who we are, we show up to work fully and authentically. If organizations truly encourage their employees to bring their whole selves to work, they will create a more inclusive and diverse work environment. And inclusive design is all about putting the users at the heart of the design process. So today we're going to present on holistic wellness through seven different dimensions. Inspiration from this presentation is drawn from the Clarion University Wellness Wheel. As we discussed a moment ago, with respect to the relationships of the human experience to the building company and world at large, we also need to acknowledge the complexity of holistic wellness, much like the complexity of the systems that make up our physical body. 
we will experience greater joy and a sense of thriving when all aspects of the holistic wellness wheel are engaged. And if any dimension here is weak, it can create ripple effects that have an impact on other areas of our life. The seven dimensions, which we will unravel today, include physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, occupational, social, and environmental. We will present each dimension, starting first by introducing what this dimension means on a personal level. We'll follow it up with how this dimension manifests within design projects. And then we'll close out with ways this dimension can be assessed at a corporate level with a focus on hybrid working and technology. So let's kick it off with physical wellness. On a personal level, physical wellness refers to the ways in which we move our body, the nutrition or food we put into our bodies, and how we continue to tend to our bodies, for example, through preventative health checks. Caroline is going to introduce the ways which physical wellness can be supported through building design. Thanks, Megan. One of the most impactful architectural moves we can make in a project is introducing a stair and an atrium. If done well, the central stair will be the primary vertical circulation in the office, even above elevators. And that's really the goal here. Aside from the obvious physical benefits of taking the stair throughout the day, the central stair is also a landmark and a symbol of a connected and silo-free workplace. Not only are these major destinations to drive movement throughout the building, but they also encourage those super important serendipitous encounters, offer surprise and delight, and certainly bring the wow factor. One of the first planning concepts we look at in a new project is primary and secondary circulation. Getting people into and through the workplace with ease is foundational to its success. When planning circulation paths, destinations should be strategically placed to facilitate in wayfinding and also provide visual interest. Ultimately, the circulation path should be easily identifiable to encourage movement, including walking meetings. Neuropsychiatry studies show that when people move, it stimulates cognition and brain function, making for improved creativity and problem solving, not only in real time, but shortly after also. We've even had one headquarters project that we worked on that valued walking meetings and physical fitness so much that we designed a circulation loop that embedded the distance walked in the floor for personal tracking. The one-size-fits-all office is severely underserving the wide range of activities that employees do throughout the day. In the office of the past, employees were assigned to a desk, and it's as simple as that. All the work was supposed to happen there. Not only does this reinforce sedentary behaviors, which we know to be a major health risk, but in many cases, it doesn't provide for the proper environment for all types of work to happen. For example, if you're trying to do focus work at your desk, but your three neighbors are collaborating on something next to you, that will be disruptive, and these are predictable and known issues. The assigned desk model is also inefficient from a square foot per person perspective, and this will only be worsened as organizations move to a hybrid work model moving forward with some employees in office and some remote. In other words, we don't want to have an assigned desk for employees working from home three days a week. But in a departure from the traditional workplace is a not so new working model called activity-based working or ABW. For over 10 years, many of our clients across the globe have adopted this working model that offers employees a wide variety of work settings to choose from based on the task at hand. To put it simply, ABW empowers employees by offering choice in where they work in the office. By taking a deep dive into understanding the types of work that are being done, we can intentionally design work settings that support them. In addition to increased productivity, engagement, overall employee satisfaction, it also inherently encourages employees to move around in the office significantly more than if they only had the option of sitting at their desk throughout the entire day. And this is a real win for physical wellness since sedentary desk work is acknowledged as the new smoking. An added benefit of ABW and moving to different settings is it also extends the range of postures throughout the day. As we've already talked about, the research shows the connection between physical exercise and improved creative thinking. But the catch is that these benefits may only apply to people who already get regular exercise. We've all seen the growing competition for in-office gyms before the pandemic. It was far beyond an, an office trend. And we see the continued need and desire for in-office fitness facilities in the future post-pandemic office also. Of course, there are the wellness and the physical benefits but there are also community building benefits there. 
thinking specifically about HIT or yoga classes, particularly if they're tied to the culture of the company. For all these reasons, we see fitness spaces as being another destination or driver to bring people to the office. And these spaces don't need to take up an entire building or floor in all cases. We've seen plenty of small offices with successful multi-purpose spaces designed to accommodate free weights, yoga, and meditation. We're also seeing more clients demonstrate their support for employee physical well-being by building in facilities that encourage walking, running, or even biking to work. Again, these don't need to be expansive spaces, but they need to get the job done and also exemplify the value placed on this from an organizational level. They say kitchens are the heart of the home and it's true in the office environment also. We often design kitchens off the central stair and plaza space, and this isn't by coincidence either. These critical destinations work together to create spaces that serve multiple functions, are active all day long, and expand during peak times. In the post-pandemic workplace, these spaces become even more desirable as a place to reconnect with colleagues after so much time apart. The space has the opportunity to encourage healthy new behaviors and even long-standing habits if properly designed with clear visible access to healthy food if the organization has chosen to offer that and even a place to prepare food from home. Lastly, we have one of the newer amenities that we've seen. This is an in-office clinic with medical staff like Eden Health's partnership with Convene. The CEO and co-founder of Convene says, now more than ever, progressive companies are prioritizing their employees' physical and mental health and investing tremendous resources to create a better workplace experience. And now Megan will take us through the policies and technology to support the hybrid workforce beyond the walls of the office. Thanks, Caroline. So as referenced earlier, health and wellness must go beyond the walls of the built environment in order to really create the desired outcomes of a healthy and productive workforce. So that question becomes, how can companies do this in a hybrid working model? So we're seeing companies turn towards their own operational policies, which includes opportunities that are applicable for in-office, virtual, and hybrid work models. Many of us have all been inspired by the operational policies introduced by the well building standard, and this is a really great starting place to turn to. In addition to those, we're seeing many companies turn towards virtual fitness programs like ClassPass, for example, to support their staff in staying active while working from home, especially if staff have been accustomed to fitness centers provided by work previously. We've also seen a rise in telemedicine and how this has shifted the ways in which we connect with our doctors, including virtual health screenings. Therefore, companies are ensuring that they're offering health benefits with providers that support these virtual options. And although we have not been traveling much over the past year, we know that business travel at some level will come back. So as we return to office and return to travel, strategies are starting to ramp up. And we really encourage companies to be more mindful than ever with future business travel plans, both for workforce well-being as well as the environmental footprint. So next, we're going to talk about two dimensions, spiritual and emotional wellness. Now, spiritual wellness is about understanding our belief systems, our personal values, and ethics that guide our lives. Emotional wellness is connected to mental health and emotional well being. It's about managing stress, getting proper sleep, and the ability to ask for help and set healthy boundaries. So, Caroline will kick us off with a few design strategies that support spiritual and emotional wellness in the workplace. The traditional one size fits all office of the past was a shortcut solution, and it igno ignored so many factors, including personality types. Introverts represent one third to one half of all workers, yet these environments have been predominantly designed for extroverts, leaving our introverted colleagues to make do with a space that's anything but comfortable for them. It's important for organizations and their workplace designers and architects to understand the makeup of the workforce. Beyond demographics, we should seek to understand the traits, the values, and the ways of working of the employees. It wasn't until the rise of activity-based working where this balance started to change. In this mobile working model, as we had talked about in the last section, employees can choose where they want to work within the office environment based on the task at hand. With activity-based working, employees are liberated from their assigned desk, but they gain the entire office. 
This model supports everything from deep focused work to group brainstorming and everything in between. When the office is aligned with employees' needs, it frees them up to be their authentic selves and in turn improves engagement and commitment. But to address the full spectrum of holistic wellness, the workplaces, workplace should have additional space types to allow for sensory balance and psychological safety too. In Susan Cain's best-selling book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, she talks about the restorative niche. And this is a place you can go to when you want to return to your true self. It can be a quiet physical place or a quiet temporal one. And the important point here is that it's a designated place for quiet alone time. Belonging is being accepted into a community by being your authentic self. This is part of the shared human experience and a sense of belonging as a human need, just like the need for food and shelter. Belonging especially helps us see value in life and deal with intensely painful emotions. In those moments, we rely on our support systems, our communities, whether they're at home, at work, or somewhere else. Studies show that when Studies show that a sense of belonging to a greater community improves your motivation, your health, and your happiness. And that's because that shared experience of seeing your community grapple with issues and realizing that you're not alone. After working from home for nearly a year, experience will definitely be one of the drivers back to the office. Now, this isn't a radically new idea for this audience, but the pandemic has certainly highlighted the necessity of it for many organizations. Particularly if the workforce is partially or even fully hybrid, it'll be important to make going to the office an enriching and purposeful experience, even an emotional touchstone to the company. Lastly, inclusive restrooms have become much more common in the workplace to address cultural and gender identity issues. In fact, we're working on a large headquarters project right now that's recently adopted this. It's one thing to talk about diversity and inclusion values as an organization, but it's another to actually build your space to support them. By designing restrooms to be universal or not separated by males or females, but instead a common change room with private change cubicles, it sends a clear message that everyone is accepted. It demonstrates that the organization doesn't just tolerate workers' differences, but it actually supports and affirms them. And Megan will take us through the policies and technology to support the hybrid workforce. Um, thanks, Caroline. So with respect to spiritual and emotional wellness at the corporate level, we've seen the following strategies. Some companies are providing uh, mindfulness apps like Headspace, which help introduce some employees to meditation for the first time ever. We're seeing virtual stress management programs and or mental health awareness trainings that help to bust through the stigma about mental health at the leadership levels and management levels. And this kind of training then in turn supports staff in taking mental health days because those are sick days too. And it will benefit the business in the long run and staff will be operating at higher levels of effectiveness. We also have seen corporate employee assistance programs, sometimes known as EAPs. And these are offered as part of health benefits so that employees can have easier access to get some support um, such as therapy. So for example, our company's EAP can help our staff and their families in times of need when dealing with personal or professional concerns. All the services are strictly confidential. The EAP program provides behavioral health, legal and financial resources and lifestyle and fitness management assistance. It includes unlimited phone consultations along with limited free and discounted sessions. So the next dimension is intellectual wellness. And this is all about engagement and creativity, awareness, education, and personal development. We might first define engagement. And it says an employee is engaged at work if they are involved in, enthusiastic about, and committed to their work and their workplace. Being a highly engaged employee does not necessarily mean you have to have a high attendance in company events or that you engage in conversation during every staff meeting, but it means that you have an emotional commitment towards your work and the organization and, and its goals. In such, you have a sense of connectivity and connection to the company and you feel like they have an interest in your personal development as a human, not just as an asset. Amber will now walk us through the ideas on how intellectual wellness is supported 
in the workplace. A library provides access to in-office resources, reference books, files, other materials, but perhaps more importantly, it also provides a completely quiet space for deep thought. We often compare this space to a reading room in a university library because we recommend no talking aloud. So instead of just putting headphones on, employees can find a spot in the library for a couple of hours and not worry about being disrupted. The library is really our solution to the distracting open office of the past. Many of our clients are really looking forward to working in this space post COVID-19, especially those that have had a pretty distracting work from home situation. According to research by Cushman and Wakefield, 36% of employees engaged in remote work during COVID-19 restrictions do not feel like they are learning. We believe that professional development and training, including onboarding, will be key drivers to the new workplace. Since people will use these learning spaces for long periods of time, maybe all day sessions, they must be designed and furnished with well-being in mind. Ideally, these spaces are all inclusive, meaning they have everything needed for a long session in one room. So this could include a small kitchenette for beverages and catering, a lounge area if people need to break away and respond to an email, uh, even remote pods uh, directly off of, of these learning spaces to jump into for a private phone call. But it isn't just formal learning that has suffered during the pandemic, but tacit learning as well. Tacit knowledge is acquired through experience and can't be reproduced or shared easily. Oftentimes, key players in an organization have more tacit knowledge than a new employee. So, for example, a new employee can oftentimes learn more by simply eavesdropping on conversations between more experienced employees than from a formal training session. Tacit knowledge is challenging in a remote work environment. So we believe this is another key driver to the workplace. Providing impromptu and formal collaboration spaces enables tacit learning and mentorship while also driving creative and innovative thinking. An estimated four to six percent of high school students in the U.S. are diagnosed with learning disabilities. And these two million plus people move forward into the workforce. It's important to think about the issues they face as they transition from the educational environment to a work environment. For example, a person with dyslexia may want to turn on the voice output on their computer. So by, by including plenty of pods soundproof uh, throughout the workplace, they can always find a place to, to support them. Megan will now take us through some policies and technology that support intellectual wellness beyond the walls of the office. Awesome, thanks Amber. With respect to professional development and training for staff, we see firms creating internal academies, not just focused on up-leveling technical skills, but also on what some may call soft skills. However, they're anything but soft, they're really hard. Emotional intelligence is a huge trend in recruitment today, and supporting staff to develop these skills creates the internal pipeline for our future leadership. This may also include formal one-on-one -on -one men mentorship programs. And we're also seeing companies bringing in speakers and personal development coaches for staff to participate in large or small setting presentations. Staff give so much to the companies, and therefore we see this as an opportunity for employees to receive, which can provide a much needed breath of fresh air into their work experience and leave them feeling empowered and intellectually nourished. The next dimension is occupational wellness. So occupational wellness defined by the World Health Organization is dealing with all aspects of health and safety in the workplace with a focus on primary prevention of hazards. So there's three key areas. Number one, the maintenance and promotion of workers' health and working capacity. 
Number two, the improvement of the working environment, which is conducive to safety. And three, the development of working cultures, which promote a positive social climate and smooth operation that may enhance productivity. This last one, this concept of working culture should be reflected in practice through managerial systems, policies, training programs, and quality of management. It includes how to avoid pre-existing pre conditions that cause problems in the occupation, correct posture at work, frequency of rest breaks, preventative action that can be undertaken, and creating an environment which is equitable for all staff experiences. So now back to Amber, who's gonna talk you about occupational wellness in the workplace. According to Steelcase Research, People across the globe rate safety issues as their top concerns about returning to the office. Adherence to safety protocols, air quality, and facility cleanliness are the most important. People will need to feel confident that their workplaces are safe and trust their employers and peers are doing everything possible to keep them safe before returning. A well-designed reception with a security and health checkpoint makes an incredible first impression on employees and guests. Organizations can also improve overall air quality and ventilation by increasing outdoor air, increasing the effectiveness of open windows with additional fans, increasing total airflow to occupied spaces, and increasing air filtration. To address facility cleanliness, sensor technology, We've seen that uh, become really popular, can be installed to indicate which areas have been used that day for targeted after hours cleaning. We believe the energy of the workplace should be designed with intention and, and purpose. We often call this the acoustic landscape of the office as it maps the full spectrum of spaces from hot or active to cool or quiet. The hot zones support louder, more energetic activities, while the cool zones support more focused work. There are also transition zones, very important, in the middle that recharge employees between activities and encourage those serendipitous encounters along the way. We believe the post-pandemic workplace will prioritize collaborative and community space but it must also accommodate and promote individual and quiet workspace to, to really enhance employee productivity and well-being. We envision the new workplace to have more diversity and choice and where employees can work than ever before, really moving away from that one size fits all office for good. By providing distinct spaces for collaboration and distinct spaces for concentration, Employees are empowered to choose where they want to work based on the task at hand. And so the, the general idea is that employees will be more productive when they have the right spaces for the work they need to accomplish. In the US, many mothers return to work after a very short amount of time, and they need a dedicated place to collect and store breast milk in the office. When employers provide a lactation room that promotes relaxation, it leads to longer term peace of mind for a new mom. She begins to believe that she will be able to return to work and provide for her child. That employer support builds loyalty among employees and encourages retention, which is just smart from a financial perspective. Liz York of the CBC estimates that the cost of building a lactation room can be as little as $5,000, while the cost of replacing just one employee is at least $15,000. There are many benefits to offering on-site child care in the workplace, including lower absenteeism, access to a larger talent pool, more women in leadership, and longer tenure. Patagonia reported that the turnover rate for parents who use the on-site center is 25% lower than those other employees. Of course, on-site childcare is a huge investment for an organization and not really the right cultural fit for every organization out there. 
There are other ways to support parents within the workplace. And one example shown here is providing a child play space in the office where employees can bring their children for a couple of hours after school or even if their regular child care facility is closed. I'll now pass it over to Megan to learn about how organizations can support occupational wellness for the hybrid workforce. Thanks, Amber. So we're seeing some companies leveraging employee surveys to better understand staff's evolving needs, especially around work-life balance. Another hot topic right now is this conversation about workplace re-entry strategies and the development of policies to support the hybrid work model but also, <clears throat> excuse me, flexible work hours. Flexible work hours have been a necessity for parents in particular, and some have been able to find a, a balance through a four day work week. So exploring alternative um, packages for staff. There's also been a big conversation, not just around work-life balance, but around work-life integration. You know, over this past year working from home, we got to know your dog, your cat, your kids, your partner, your roommate, which creates this sense of authenticity, vulnerability, and intimacy that was missing in many of our work cultures previously. So we see this as an opportunity to keep those connections going. And some of, some of the ways to do that are hosting sponsored events, which include family members and friends. And lastly, if your company has not looked at more progressive policies around parental leave, which support new mothers re-entering the workforce in um, more supportive ways, and also family leave policies for those unforeseen events, well, now is the time to reimagine the future of work for the next generation. All right, next dimension, it's social wellness. So social wellness, it's about having strong social network and support systems. After a year of being socially distant, I don't know about you, but I'm craving my people. I can't wait to get back into the office with colleagues and clients in a safe and mindful way, of course. We are social and interpersonal creatures that require connection to survive. So when our nervous system has been dysregulated by stress and trauma, for example, as we've all been experiencing over the past year, it leaves us unfulfilled and even limits our ability to connect with others. So even though we're excited about social connections in the near future, we also need to be gentle with ourselves as we re-enter into society, as it may feel a little bit awkward at first. Amber is now gonna show us the ways social wellness can be fostered through design. Thanks, Megan. Relationships at work are key to overall well being, and organizations need to deliberately create environments that nurture and support these social relationships. We often refer to the plaza as the heart of the workplace. In the post pandemic era, this community space becomes even more important as we reconnect after so much time apart. The plaza is the most significant destination in the workplace and it draws people to it from across the organization that wouldn't typically cross paths. It's where employees can work, meet, socialize, grab coffee, and it is used around the clock, not just at lunchtime. It can also facilitate all hands meetings and special events as seen here. The plaza may be quite expansive in a multi-floor office, and it really is the perfect opportunity for an open atrium and stair. Certain functions that are frequently used, like meeting spaces, should be immediately accessible to the surrounding users. While more social spaces, like the plaza, should actually be in functionally inconvenient locations to force people to come together. Oftentimes we uh, tour existing offices and we see small kitchens sprinkled throughout the workplace. And the problem is these, these kitchenettes are so convenient that employees never really leave their corner of the office. And they just see the same small group of people every day. 
So by drawing people to one centralized community space or plaza, they're forced to leave their immediate area and they have a chance to interact with colleagues across the organization, which can lead to innovative new business endeavors. We believe one of the key drivers to the post-pandemic workplace is collaboration. And we all know that virtual collaboration can be challenging, especially brainstorming and strategy sessions. And we've heard uh, from many of our clients that the virtual tools simply cannot replace the in-person interactions. So these collaborative spaces in the workplace should be super functional with digital displays, whiteboards, standing height tables and stools. It's also important that these spaces are acoustically buffered from the quieter areas of focused work um, or else they'll be terribly distracting and may go unused. The ground level or even several lower levels of an office building should be porous. This allows employees to interact with the surrounding community and the community can interact with the company or the brand. New or enhanced community programs include fitness and wellness centers, coffee shops, restaurants, co-working spaces. Another example is a market with fresh produce, baked goods, flowers, wine, so that employees can quickly pick up some items for dinner on their way home. These types of spaces serve both the employees and the surrounding community. We're seeing many buildings extend their operating hours to really become a more integral part of the surrounding neighborhood. And I'll pass it back over to Megan, who will now share how social wellness of hybrid workers can be supported in the post-pandemic era. Great. So let's be honest, not all virtual gatherings are worth more of our time online in front of screens. But there are some great companies that are out there thinking hard about virtual events with a focus on health and well-being and engagement, which can be also include catered food options that are delivered to your home. Check out the Awaken Agency, for example. Also, employee resource groups, sometimes known as ERGs, is a great way for staff to come together in a safe place and talk about their challenges and shared experiences. All right, let's move on to the last dimension. Last but not least, nearest and dearest to my heart, environmental wellness. This is all about being environmentally responsible in your day-to-day -day work, as well as when you're working from home. As we like to say, it's about walking the talk. And appropriately, with tomorrow being Earth Day, we want to give a shout out to all those companies making big and bold climate commitments right now. Thank you so much for your commitment. So I'll now take you through some of the ways in which projects are looking at strategies for environmental wellness that connect also to human health. As many companies pivot to a hybrid work model, we're seeing massive reductions in commercial office real estate because companies are able to downsize their leasable space. So as Caroline and Amber have introduced already, leveraging an activity-based working design or ABW design approach with a hybrid work model can help to reduce your leasable space by nearly 20%. Although some may see this as an economic downfall, it can also be seen as a huge opportunity. Empty class B and C office spaces can be reimagined for new purposes, such as solving our housing crisis. This also helps to reduce our need to build new buildings, which have huge embodied carbon footprints. Time is critical with a climate crisis and an emphasis on adaptive reuse is long overdue. The fastest and most impactful way to reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions is to build less new buildings and focus on retrofitting existing buildings. Most of us by now have heard about biophilic design principles. It's a way of connecting humans to nature, which not only boosts productivity, but support the regulation of our nervous systems. The reality is that we as humans are nature. We rely on nature. And therefore, the more opportunities we have to immerse ourselves with it, the more optimal we perform in every way. Projects are creating immersive indoor-outdoor experiences where we even blur the lines between the two environments themselves. And so 
when it comes to indoor working environments, finding every way to encourage nature into our designs will also be conducive. There are a number of design uh, philosophies and frameworks which can be followed, such as Terrapin's 14 Principles of Biophilic Design and Kellert's Biophilic Design Patterns. They include ideas such as incorporating nature-based elements inside, nat uh, natural ventilation, access to daylight and views, natural fiber materials, and creating nature-inspired patterns. Here on this slide, you see an example of inviting high quality daylight into the workplace while mitigating glare and optimizing for solar PV generation through a sawtooth roof. This project was also an example of specifying products which focus on healthy materials. Sustainability consultants and architects are working in partnership with clients and product manufacturers to remove the worst in class chemicals from the built environment. Some of you may have heard of the Red List from the Living Building Challenge, which is an aspirational target for many projects. I mean, it's called a challenge for a reason. But most of our projects today start with the goal of eliminating Red List chemicals, especially on interior finishes, regardless if they go for the full certification. Now let's talk about the intersection of environmental wellness and human experienced comfort. As we have reflected previously, no two people are the same. So when it comes to physical comfort, and in particular thermal comfort, the zone of comfort can vary widely human to human, especially due to factors such as metabolic rate. One of the best strategies today, which works especially well in activity-based working environments, is to create different spaces with varying thermal comfort experiences and even different physical comfort or light quality. Therefore, staff can sit in a place that suits their personal needs. This requires some thoughtfulness and with respect to thermal comfort, possibly some uh, CFD modeling to validate our assumptions. But many projects are adding these considerations um, also for individual controllability and feedback, such as a product called Comfy, which can provide user feedback to the mechanical and ventilation systems, leveraging an algorithm to make adjustments that balance the needs of multiple inputs. Now, continuing on this theme of thermal comfort, some projects consider the benefits of natural ventilation, which is when you bring outside air in through the windows passively, rather than fully controlled through mechanical systems. Natural ventilation is a strategy that not only reduces energy demands of the building's mechanical system, but when we bring in fresh outdoor air, it improves overall air quality of the space, and it helps us to feel more connected to nature as well as it's been tied to greater occupant satisfaction. Although it's important that you understand the quality of the outdoor air before you'd want to consider this design strategy. At the company and corporate level, everyone is jumping on the climate commitment train. There are so many options out there and probably the greatest challenge is finding the commitment that's right fit for your company. Luckily, sustainability consultants are very well versed in the environmental alphabet soup and can navigate the ever-growing space and play matchmaker for you. It's also worth noting some of the silver linings from the pandemic, such as reductions in greenhouse gas emissions associated with reduced employee commute and business travel. But we are not completely off the hook. Just because your GHG emissions may be a bit lower at the office, some of those emissions just shifted from the office to your home. So keep your eyes peeled for a conversation about what some are calling scope four emissions or work from home emissions. And as companies start to consider hybrid work models and returning to the office, there's also a rise in new innovative mobility partners, such as, such as a company called Fleet. And lastly, the big movement and buzz around zero waste. This means focusing on your supply chain purchases. Less is more and to purchase things that are really truly recyclable or compostable. And, you know, check out, are you composting both at home and in the office? This makes a huge impact. And better yet at home, build that backyard compost. It not only reduces greenhouse gas emissions, but you create amazing soil for your home garden and get the co-benefits of supporting your personal micro microbiome by getting your hands in the dirt. And it just feels good to be doing something good for the environment. 
It's probably clear by now that wellness is more than health, it's fully living. Much like the complexity of our own body systems, we must acknowledge the complexity of whole life wellness too. And while we should be thinking about the seven dimensions for ourselves and in the spaces we design, it's important to acknowledge that this looks different for everyone. Your balance will be different than my balance. The goal of holistic wellness is to find a personal harmony with the dimensions that are most authentic for you. And as we begin to reemerge from the pandemic, now's the time to rebuild and to create a future that embraces our well being, all seven aspects of it. Traditionally, when we arrive at work, we leave something at the office door, and the same applies to getting home. This is because historically, employees have covered up parts of their identity to fit in at work. Sheryl Sandberg once said, bring your whole self to work. I don't believe we have a professional self Monday through Friday and a real self the rest of the time. It is all professional and it is all personal. Bringing your whole self to work alleviates the pressure to leave some of your personality behind. When we can truly be ourselves, we can reach our full potential. And when employees thrive, business thrives. Thanks for bringing that home for us, yeah. Amber. And, uh, and thanks for everyone who spent some time with us today so far. So we have a few minutes left. Um, so we'll go into the Q&A portion. I see we have some questions that have already come through here. Amber, maybe you can take this one. Do you find that your clients are advocating for these strategies also? Yeah, we are. Um, they're they're at least aware of these um, of these strategies, but a lot of times we bring them to the forefront very early on in um, engagement with them during visioning. Um, and if they're particularly interested, um, we oftentimes bring on a sustainability and wellness consultant to to support our team um, and to just dive even deeper into all the possibilities. Um, yeah, around employee wellness. But I, I would say, yeah, that all clients are at least um, aware of this and, and bring forth these ideas. It's really about how to execute them well. And that's where a lot of times a, a consultant who specializes in this is, is really helpful. It's like we've been working with Megan specifically on a project about just this. Megan, I think this is a good question for you. How and when do you start the conversation with clients about holistic wellness? Yeah, and I think that spins off of the previous question, you know, that Amber received. And, um, you know, sometimes we're brought in as a sustainability consultant, but I always come back to the definition of sustainability, which is a triple bottom line. It's people, planet, and profit, you know? And so that people aspect is a part of the sustainability conversation. It's not just about the planetary environment. And as you saw also the definition of wellness and holistic wellness also includes the environment. So, you know, whatever that opening is from the client, we see it as our job to talk about all of it and to present it holistically. Um, you know, we're brought in at different parts of the project. Um, ideally, we're brought in in like early visioning and concept because then we can really bake it into the DNA of a project. And, um, you know, for example, when I was working with, with Amber and Caroline recently, we use a desired outcomes-based approach and you have plenty of time to explore, you know, what is the ultimate desired outcome of this project? And those become these beacons that carry the job forward and continue to come back to. Um, but then other times we're brought in, you know, later in schematic design and, and you're trying to kind of layer sustainability and wellness on after the fact. It's challenging, but I think our tactic and our approach is it's really key to educate the entire group, you know, all the stakeholders at the table because everyone's coming with different levels of understanding. And so what we do is we'll present, like, for example, the wellness wheel, we'll present the wellness wheel, we'll present other methodologies as well. And we'll just allow um, the stakeholders and the client to choose which one they feel most connected to. Um, but I think just like presenting all of these, these different approaches and philosophies um, to gauge their interest is, is our approach. That's great, Megan. I think we have time for maybe one more um, and I can take this one. It says, big picture, how do you see the office changing post pandemic? This is a big question. 
Um, and I think it's going to be different for every industry and every organization. So it's it's really hard to make broad predictions. But thinking about what we've heard so far, uh, we do see a hybrid model emerging um, that we had talked about earlier today. And in that hybrid model, workers will use the office differently than they did pre-pandemic um, when they were in the office 100% of the time. So naturally, the office will need to transition to support that too. Um, Amber and I recently wrote an article, it's on our website, about the post-pandemic workplace. And we talk about exactly this in the article. And we identified three different types of workers, anchors, connectors, and navigators. And each of the types ranges from more in office to less in office. And you know, every organization has their own unique mix of the three. Um, but it's important to think about who's gonna be into the office so that you can design the office space for the times when they are there. Uh, generally, I can say that we typically see a large population coming into the office to do things that they just can't do from home. And these would be the connectors and the navigators between those three types. So that's working with colleagues, dealing with physical products, all hands events, and other types of work that are really best in person. Um, and to support this, we're seeing a big increase in meeting rooms and informal spaces for coming together after so much time apart. And lots of unassigned spaces also uh, to help these people have a place to touch down when they're in the office for a full day of meetings. But then on the other side of the spectrum, there will definitely be a portion of the population that needs to be in the office, and those would be the anchors, um, because it's based on job function or that their home doesn't provide a, an environment to do really focused work. Um, so we do see that the post-pandemic office will be much more varied than it's ever been to really support all the new ways that people are working. And I think that that brings us to, to the end of our time here. Thank you so much for all of the questions and comments. I think that we will go ahead and answer those in a, in a follow-up. We'll put some thought to them and, and get back to everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you guys um, for a great presentation. Um, our friends at Work Design Magazine will be doing a follow-up piece and um, we'll be speaking with Caroline, Megan and, and Amber and we'll make sure that, um, that we send those additional questions we didn't um, get to. So maybe those could be answered in the, in the follow-up piece and we'll send it out to everybody who um, who is attending, um, that should be out in the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll also have a, a recording of this session on our Neocon site within the next couple of days. Um, so again, thank you ladies. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, we have three additional programs running tomorrow as part of our Designing Well um, series. So we hope you might be able to join us uh, for those as well. So, so thanks again. Take care, guys.